This week on Football, Ronaldo breaks Scottish hearts with goal number 901. England inspired by their 12th man. The Snakes are back. I said before the game, I think it's different, you know, like me and Deck have, you know, nothing bad to say, you know. Rooney rolls back the years. Penalty to Dortmund. Twitter's favourite Tara Kirk is at it again. Oh, time for another Tara update. What's that supposed to mean? And we finally find the people who update the life score app. Hello everyone, welcome to This Week on Football, it is me Alex, how are we all doing? As you know, I'm going to do my little bit at the start to try and encourage you to follow the show. If you haven't already subscribed, hit the subscribe button. If you haven't already liked the video, like it. It's already great. It's brilliant. We saw Tara Kirk. Why wouldn't you like that? Um, if you haven't followed me over on TikTok, I am on TikTok, Alex Goalposts. All the best bits, all the interesting bits, none of the nonsense, well, some of the nonsense, but go over there and follow me on there as well. Um, we have got a fun fill show coming up this week. We're going to be doing my team of the week. I've got my weekend treble, which at the moment is earning you guys a fortune. I'll be revisiting football's entertainers as well. But first, seeing as it is an international break, I thought I would reflect. The summer has gone, the dust has settled, and Carsley Ball is well underway. But I think it's a great opportunity to reflect on Gareth Southgate and his time as England manager. Now, as much as you guys might want to try and get me to believe that Gareth Southgate was this terrible manager and anti-football, I think he was a lot more than that. And for me personally, I think Gareth Southgate gave me some of the greatest football moments I've ever had in my life, let alone just England. When you look back at some of the moments that Gareth Southgate gave us the Luke Shaw goal in the final where we all hoped and dreamed that something was going to happen the Trippier free kick against Croatia in the World Cup the penalties against Colombia in the same World Cup uh, just as recent actually as the the penalties in the last years and the Bellingham overhead kick goal Gareth Southgate was the master of all of those moments now you might say that we had a team that should have won things and probably at times was mismanaged. I understand the criticism, but at the same time, we've always had great players. We've always had great teams. And I think this is the closest we've ever got to really kind of experiencing fulfillment of potential. And that's what I'll go with on that. But I don't think that there was another manager who could have brought us together from such a low place to this place where we are now expecting to win trophies, getting to finals, semi-finals, knocking out big sides as well. And just as recently, like I said, as the summer, Ollie Watkins moment against Netherlands may just be the greatest England moment I've experienced as a fan in my lifetime because that was a moment that was so unexpected, so out of nowhere, a last minute winner against a giant side like the Netherlands to get us to a major tournament final. We have to respect the players on the pitch, the manager who got us there. And you can tell me all you like that Bellingham's this, he's got an attitude problem, he's cocky, he's too overconfident. Nothing will stop me from loving that man. He is an absolute treasure. We have got a player who's potentially world-class, who probably already is world-class and potentially the best player on the planet. And he plays for England. Love him up. Same as Ollie Watkins. He should go into every stadium. And I know they didn't win anything, but every stadium in the country and get an applause. And that's from me as a Man United fan. I don't care who he plays for. I don't care who Trent Alexander-Arnold plays for. I don't care that he's a Liverpool player and Liverpool fan, but... He scored that winning penalty to take us through. I don't care. We have to get on board and support these England players, support the next manager. Look, Lee Carsley wouldn't have been my choice. As far as tactical sense goes, he would have been probably number one choice because I love what he's done with the 21s. I just don't want an Irish manager managing the England team. And that's just, that's just how I see it. I don't see anyone who is not an English national 
that should be a part of an England national team. I don't get it. That's just me personally. I know people have their own opinions on that. I'm fully willing to get behind Lee Carsley because actually what I see, the initial stages, I think when you're going to be seeing this, this is just off the back of the Finland game. We've had the game against Ireland, which was really impressive. Jack Grealish coming back into the team. Declan Rice scoring and obviously the snakes are back banner. It was a lovely moment for Lee Carsley. And if anyone did doubt how much he wanted this team to win and to beat his home nation, look at the celebration from that Rice goal. He was over the moon and ecstatic. So yes, I'm behind him. I'm behind any manager who gets into that hot seat and it is a horrible task and it definitely is a hot seat. If they're English, I'm more behind them. If they're not, look, I, it's the FA's decision. I can't control it. I wouldn't personally pick anyone who's not English. But as far as I'm concerned, I think we've got the best manager for the job. I love Lee Carsley's attitude. I love what he's doing. There is something very honest slot about the way he's set up. In previous tournaments gone by, for the ends of 21s, he was playing James Garner at right back, who was then dropping into midfield. Trent is now filling that role. He was very keen on getting width with Anthony Gordon, Cole Palmer. I think that's going to happen again, but maybe Palmer playing in the 10. Jack Grealish came into the side. He likes ball carriers, Kobe Mainu, Angel Gomez as well. Angel Gomez, who was... He's basically been in the wilderness since he left Manchester United, but he's back in that side because of what impact he made on that under-21 squad. And I think he can do that again. He is probably about a year or so away from a big move back to the Premier League, I imagine, because I think he's got that quality. He was always played out right wing for Man United or left wing for Man United. I think he's found his best position because he is fantastic on the ball. A lot of Kobe Mainu traits. Be interesting to see who gets that shirt. One of them will play under Lee Carsley. And I don't want this just to be a Lee Carsley comes in, fills the gap, and then we bring in someone like Eddie Howe. And that's me personally. I, again, I know you've got your own opinions on that. I don't think Eddie Howe would be the right man. We need someone who can develop a culture of winning. Lee Carsley has done that from the under-21s. We need someone who's got a clear identity to be a big nation, a big national team manager and Spain have got it. Germany have always had it. The Netherlands, even to a certain extent over the past 20, 30 years, have had it. It's time that we got it. Italy have had it. So I think what really impressed me about that performance against Ireland, we controlled the ball. The ball was in our possession, obviously, the majority of the time. It's going to be when England play maybe a lesser nation. But we scored the goal and then we just took control of the game and it was perfect. There was no rush. There was no kind of, we've got to get another, we've got to get another. We were dictating play we never really came close to conceding and it was as measured a 2-0 away performance in a hostile environment that you can probably ask for so early signs Lee Carsley I do like it I'm a big fan but like I said as I started off with that don't forget all the work the hard work that Gareth Southgate and his team did to get us competing again and to to get a, a feel-good factor around the national team. So I think that's important. Right, I said I'm going to do my team of the week. Absolutely outrageous team of the week this this week because the level and standard of football I've watched is here and also here. So bear with me. In goal, uh, did anyone watch the Barrow versus Swindon game? If you did, I apologise. It would have been a really tough tough ordeal for you to watch because it was just about the worst quality game I've ever seen in my life but something stood out and that was defender Irish defender Rory Feely now early on in the first half the goalkeeper for Barrow got sent off now that can happen what doesn't tend to happen is a manager doesn't have a named substitute goalkeeper on the bench they didn't they went into that game knowing that if something happened to the goalkeeper they were going to be in the mud uh, lo and behold the goalkeeper gets sent off after 40 minutes or whatever it was in the first half and they had to throw a defender in goal for over an hour maybe 70 minutes because of added time and what a performance now if you've seen the game the probably only the highlight you would have seen is the goal that Rory Feely conceded in the last second the dying second and it's a goal that a typical person who doesn't play in goal would would concede it's a bouncer it's a horrible shot and he doesn't deal with it but before that don't don't forget the fact that he actually had an all-round top performance he actually felt like a goalkeeper there was a brilliant save from a free kick from one of Swindon's players there was uh, just a couple of times where he just came out and claimed the ball like a proper goalkeeper he actually never felt like he was under threat of conceding a goal so 
I think I did this last season. I was going to say, actually, when I was writing this, this is the only time you're ever going to see a defender get my position as goalkeeper in my team of the week. I've actually done it with Olivier Giroud last season as well. But Rory Feely had to go in there. I know he conceded that goal. It was a horrible goal. But yeah, I, I think he deserves it because what a, what a valiant effort. Uh, at right back, another Barrow player, Neo Eccleston. If anyone didn't know, I watched Barrow versus Swindon. And uh, this is probably going to be obvious. But Neo Eccleston, right back for Barrow, thought he had a really good game. They went down to 10 men. It was really, really tough barrage from Swindon and when I say barrage actually it is arguably the worst barrage I've ever seen the left winger that came on for Swindon Cox I don't know his first name his name was Cox and it might be and I don't like saying things like this because obviously he's far superior to my technical ability he might be the worst player I've ever seen in my life genuinely the worst player I've ever seen in my life he came on left wing I couldn't believe he was a professional footballer either way Neil Eccleston had a really good game against him and then obviously unfortunate to concede the goal late on but that wasn't his fault centre-back Yannick Vestergaard his performance against Serbia really impressed me kept a clean sheet all round, just very calm, very measured. Obviously dropped down to the championship with Leicester last season, played pretty much all the games for them. And now he's back up in the Premier League. He's a Premier League centre-half, if we're honest, and he's an international standard centre-half. Yeah, very measured, very calm, composed on the ball, won everything in the air. And obviously his lack of pace sometimes gets exposed, but he's so quick in terms of speed of thought. He knows where to be, so it doesn't really affect him too much. Uh, on the other side of his career... And on the other side of Yannick Vestergaard, I've gone with Antonio Silva, the Portuguese centre-half, 20 years old for Benfica, played against Scotland the other night. And it was a narrow, narrow win for Portugal. I thought he was a really standout performance for me. I know it's a centre-half, but yeah, very, very good. Got up and down the pitch really well. Obviously, Portugal really pressing, but I thought he did really well to manage Scotland's counters and he was he was everywhere 20 years old yeah he's got a big future ahead of him Antonio Silva left back Levi Colwell one of my favorite performances from the England game thought he was brilliant at left back obviously Luke Shaw's not fit Chilwell's not capable and uh well who else is that oh, you end up with Tyreek Mitchell and all the rest I think he is the obvious choice for left back for England Levi Colwell I'll leave it at that. I just think he's brilliant. Uh, central midfield, Declan Rice. Uh, he said in the interview after the game that he felt fit again. He felt strong, felt capable. And it's obviously early on in the season, but it's great to hear from Declan Rice that he is there after a really tough last season. And then summer on top of it, um, got the goal and got the assist away at Ireland. And obviously everyone knows the connotations to that. Really, really hostile reception for Declan Rice, but came through with flying colours. I thought he was brilliant. Uh, alongside him, another person who had a hostile reception was Jack Grealish. I'm playing him central midfield because that's kind of where he was playing. He's more of a 10 for this Lee Carsley side. But yeah, I thought he was brilliant. Again, really nice to have him back. I absolutely love Jack Grealish. Love his personality more than anything. But I really missed how good Jack Grealish is as a footballer. He moved to City and he will say himself that it's probably not been his best time. But I don't think that's his fault. I don't think he lacks confidence. I don't think he ever lacks, you know, ambition and motive to go forward. I just think it's been drilled out of him to make a successful team rather than make a successful individual player. And I think he's suffered for it. I really want to see Jack Grealish get a move to another club. And I think he could play almost anywhere in the world. I think he's that good technically. It's fantastic. He's not going to get the standout performances. He's not going to get the 20 goals a season that a lot of wingers will. He's not. Just, he's just not going to get that in that pep side. But I don't think that means that we should diminish how good he actually is. I would take him at Manchester United in a heartbeat, Jack. Come to us, please. Um, and then finishing off that midfield, another player that I would take at Man United, who was at Man United, and we've somehow let him go. Scott McTominay scored against Portugal. I think it's 10 goals now in his last 17 games for Scotland. Uh why is he playing in Italy and not at Man United? I don't know. I love him. Again, I know people have their own opinions on him, but I love him. Right wing, probably the hardest position to pick for me this week. I went with Chidozi Ogbene for Ireland. He was all right. I'll leave it at that. He was the only good player that Ireland had and the only threat they really had. And I didn't really see any right wingers who stood out for me this week. Apologies. Left wing, Rafa Leao. Uh... He's someone I want to criticise, but also praise and put him in the team of my week. 
I think he is a phenomenal player. But for all the people that don't watch him every single week, you only see highlights and only see a couple of skills and some fantastic goals. You probably think, oh, this guy should be playing for Man United over Rashford. He should be playing in the Premier League. He's better than half the wingers in the world. I can promise you he's not. He is an unbelievable player, but he's not even in the top 10 wingers in world football. And I mean that maybe even 20, but he's a brilliant player. And he had a really good performance against Scotland. He was really dangerous and kind of did everything that Portugal needed in terms of getting forward, being a threat on goal. He got the assist for Bruno Fernandes, I think, as well. And then he got hooked because Roberto Martinez obviously doesn't know what he's doing with this Portugal side. Um, yes, and something on that point, people compare him to like the likes of Rashford. I've seen United fans talk about we should uh, swap Rashford out and bring in uh, Rafael Leal because they're frustrated with Rashford. If you're frustrated with Rashford, I can promise you there is another level to that frustration and that would be bringing in Rafael Leal. He couldn't lace Rashford's boots, I promise you that. He's a very good player, but Rashford's on a different level. He's just going through that form and maybe Rafael Leal's kind of staying there. So everyone looks at it differently. In terms of ability, Rashford's far superior, I promise you. Um, and then striker finishing off that team, I've got Yusuf Poulsen scored the goal of the week. What a goal. If you haven't seen this Yusuf Poulsen goal, I will try and fit it in somewhere to the video or on TikTok. It is magnificent. Overhead kick for Denmark against Serbia in a game that Denmark were controlling, but you never know. International games, you know, Serbia could have got back into it. Yusuf Poulsen popped up with an overhead kick. It was a stunning, stunning strike and yeah, had to go in there. He's always been about the place, Yusuf Poulsen. Never really pulled up any trees. Always scores about five or six goals a season. He's at Leipzig still and obviously, yeah. He always seems to score for Denmark though. He does seem to do well on the international stage. Um, right, okay, talking of international stage, we have taken a break from the Premier League football and it is killing most people. I used to really like it. I used to really enjoy international breaks because I love watching England play and how we're going to progress. I do enjoy it, but at the same time, if the Nation League's, Nations League is on and you want us to really get involved and really enjoy this competition, UEFA, then put it on TV, please. Because I would watch Andorra versus Moldova. Not even sure if that's a fixture. I would watch Iceland versus Kazakhstan. Not even sure if that's a fixture. But I would watch these games, but you don't put it on. It's on some random... I don't even know, Premier Sports or something. It's not even on those channels anymore. Just put it on. People will get behind it. Um, but during this break of Premier League football, I thought I would assess the Premier League itself and who is the face of the Premier League. This is a question I've asked myself and tried to come up with a few candidates. I've got 10 candidates and I'd like you to decide. But who is the face of the Premier League? When I talk about the face, I'm talking like uh, in the past, Thierry Henry, Wayne Rooney, um, probably previously Ronaldo. You've had Alan Shearer. You're probably going back Eric Cantona and then more recent seasons, Agueros and people like that. Who is the face of the Premier League? And my candidates, and you can add your own, but my candidates from one to ten. Number one, I've gone with Marcus Rashford. Number two, I've gone with Kevin De Bruyne. Three, I've gone with Bakayo Saka. Four, I've gone with Bruno Fernandes. Five, Rodri. Six, Mo Salah. Seven, Phil Foden. Eight, Cole Palmer. Nine, Son Heung-min. And ten, Erling Haaland. That's not in order. That's just ten of my candidates. You guys pick. Tell me who you think is the face of the Premier League. I think it's not just... It's not going to be something that is kind of like obvious and talked about, but there is kind of someone who comes to mind when you think of the Premier League. Who's that first player that comes to mind? For me, I'd probably say Erling Haaland at the moment. He is the biggest star in the Premier League. So you can't argue with that. I'd probably say it's Erling Haaland. And then previous seasons gone by, probably Harry Kane, Son, players like that. Yeah, I'd say Erling Haaland at the moment. Um, but it did get me thinking because obviously previously the face of the Premier League has always been someone who's been an iconic character, uh, usually an entertainer with the ball. And I thought about entertainers past and present and football's entertainers have disappeared. They've gone. Where have they gone? And I was thinking like players like Ronaldinho, players like Thierry Henry, players like JJ Okocha, uh, Hazard, Paul Pogba even, Yannick Balassi, players that were just like full of flair, 
were bordering on the audacious and just plain silly. They have disappeared. And I think Neymar may be the last of a dying breed. Football's entertainers have disappeared. The reason being, and we all know if we're honest with ourselves, it's because of Pep Guardiola, the greatest tactician maybe of his time, but he has killed footballers. And I talked about Jack Grealish earlier. His kind of sacrifice for the few to benefit the many, to make a team rather than individual sport, I understand. And it is a super effective formula for winning trophies and winning leagues. But doesn't it just kill football? I hate watching Man City. I hate stifling individual flair for the benefit of winning a game 1-0, 2-0, 3-0 and stifling an opponent uh, in, in the process. I just don't enjoy it. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. Even City fans can't admit that, you know, their football is enjoyable. It's effective, but we don't see those flair players anymore. I was thinking, who are the flair players at the, mo uh, at the moment? And I actually think Neymar, in terms of his actual current players who technically he still plays. I know he hasn't played over in Saudi very much, but he might be the last player to be a true football entertainer. And I was thinking as well, like maybe it's a generational thing because you go back years and years and years and you end up seeing George Best. And then if you go back further, you see players like Pele. Well, these players, they had flair, but what Neymar does with the ball is different level what Neymar does actually would get him executed for witchcraft if he took back if he kind of transported himself back into the 1950s and you put Neymar there they would execute him for witchcraft he would be strung up in front of the public and asked if he is a witch and he would have to tell them no he isn't he's just really good at football um but some of the stuff that Neymar pulls off and has pulled off you just don't see it anymore. And I'm gutted because, like I said, it's a dying breed and it's something that I think really attracted me to football is these, these flair players, the players that could do anything with the ball, Ronaldinho, just doing outrageous things. So hopefully they make a comeback. I don't know where they're going to come from. But whenever you ask someone who's the best player you've seen, we don't want to be talking Rodri. We don't want to be talking about those sort of players. I don't want to be talking about Sergio Busquets. I love these players, but come on, we want to be talking about Ronaldinho, Eden Hazard. We want to be talking about Neymar. And Neymar, one of the most underrated players of his generation as well, I think. Uh, right, let's get on to the juicy stuff. Weekend treble time. Now, I have said to you that I'm going to make you a profit this season. I said to you last season, I'm going to make you a profit. Just follow my tips, back it with whatever you want. I say £10, keep it fun, and then just keep it rolling. Now, if you invest £10 every single week into my tips, you would now be on a healthy profit of £55.82. We have just had our third weekend treble come in out of four this season. So three out of four. And when you look at actually how many selections I've got correct, it's 10 out of 12. I think it is three, six, nine, 10. 10 out of 12 selections, which is not bad. You've got to admit. The first week we got £23.23 .23 profit. The second week we lost £10. Shocking week. I'll hold my hands up. The third week, we gained £23.04. And, and then the fourth week, just gone, we gained £19.55. So time to start um, believing in me, I think. Um, actually, start, time to start believing in myself. Because to be honest with you, I back it with a tenner and that's it. If I backed it with more, I could be rich. And you could be too. Uh, so this week, I have got three selections for you to follow. Three selections that are going to make you rich. The first one is PSG to win against Brest. Hey. Uh, not breasts, breast, the team. Um, number two, sorry, I just can't stop thinking of breasts now. Uh, number two, I've got Bayern minus one against Kiel. I'm sorry, I've ruined that. Uh, Bayern to win minus one against Kiel. That is uh, an away game on Saturday. I do fancy Bayern. It's about time they got into gear and started scoring. Kiel, uh, don't know. We'll see. I don't think they've got a point yet. Um, uh, and then the third selection. I've toyed with this third, third selection all week, probably since the fixtures uh, came up and I was looking through them, I was thinking maybe Reading against Leighton Orient, maybe Real Madrid against Real Sociedad. I've gone with Man United against Southampton. If they lose, then I don't know what to say anymore. But there is no way Man United can lose to Southampton this week. There's absolutely no way. There's absolutely no way. So £10 on it will return you £34.10 on Saturday if you back it. 
with £10. Hopefully this comes in and I keep this running run up. Even if we do lose, for the guys who have been backing me every week, you'd only be down to £45 profit. You'd still be in profit by 45 quid. So stick with me this season. I am making you money. Uh, right. Thank you, guys. I will be back next week, next Wednesday and every Wednesday until the end of the season. Catch me on TikTok, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, wherever you want to listen to it or watch it. Catch Vince and me on This Is United Podcast right here on this very channel on all the uh, goalpost platforms as well. And also there may well be a goalpost for jumpers episode this week. I don't know. Hopefully there will be for all your absolute nonsense times a million. Thanks once again, guys. Have a great week.